One of the running themes throughout God's gospel, John's gospel, is that Jesus will not leave us alone, but promises to be with us in life and in death. Not only that, but Jesus tells us that he is also preparing a room just for us in his home. And he promises to come back and take us there. I am reading from the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. Don't be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My father's house has room to spare. If that weren't the case, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and take you with me so that where I am, you will be too. You know the way to the place I'm going. Thomas asked, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have really known me, you will also know the Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. This is the word of God for the people of God. There's a gray river of doubt Between my head and my heart They say seeing is believing But I only see myself Reflected in the currents of the great unknown I need a savior to carry my head and heart on So a cab driver reaches the pearly gates and he's greeted by St. Peter And St. Peter takes his name and he looks in the big book and he says, Ah, take this gold robe, this silky robe and this golden staff and enter into heaven. Next in line is a preacher. The preacher gives St. Peter his name and St. Peter looks in his book and he furrows his brow. He says, All right, we'll let you in. But take this burlap robe and this wooden staff. Well, the preacher is shocked. He says, But I'm a man of the cloth. Surely I rank higher than a cabbie. To which St. Peter says, matter of factly, listen, this is heaven. We are results oriented. When you preached, people slept. But when the cabbie drove, people prayed. (laughs) Or did you hear the one about the preacher who fell into the ocean and couldn't swim? Well, not long after that, a ship came by and the captain said, sir, looks like you could use some help. To which the pastor said, nope, God will save me. A little while later, another boat came by, and a fisherman said, Hey, buddy, do you need some help? And very calmly, he says, No, God will save me. Well, eventually, the pastor drowned and went to heaven. And the first thing he said to God was, Why didn't you save me? And God said, I tried. I sent you two boats. (laughs) All right. That's just a little levity to get us started on a conversation that can be a heavy topic to discuss Throughout time, in nearly every religion, we have seen some evidence of an afterlife. And as we look at the Bible, we see how the view of heaven evolved over time. In the Old Testament, heaven was not a place that people went, but it was the place where God lived. And the realm of the dead in the Old Testament is called Sheol, which translates literally to the land of the dead. And then in the Old Testament, eventually was translated into Greek, and the word sheol became the Greek word Hades. So that's where we find those two words. Now, the Israelites were not so concerned about the afterlife. They were more concerned about living in the here and the now. But we see that view change over time, especially in the periods between the Old and the New Testament. Now, as we near the end of the New Old Testament, we read in the book of Daniel, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. 
See, by this time, the Israelites had come to believe that in the realm of the dead, there were two distinct areas. One was called Gehenna, and that's where people were said to be tortured and tormented for being unfaithful to God. And then there was a vast chasm, and on the other side was paradise. Paradise was a word that was translated to the king's garden or the king's park. And so if a king were to honor you or to bless you, the king would invite you into his paradise or his garden. We see this thought around heaven, even in the time leading up to Jesus. And as Jesus is dying on the cross, you remember the thieves that were crucified on either side of them. And one of them says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. To which Jesus replies, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And then in the book of Isaiah, we read this. On this mountain, the Lord of heavenly forces will prepare for all peoples a rich feast, a feast of choice wines, of select foods rich in flavor, of choice wines well refined. He will swallow up death forever. The Lord God will wipe tears from every face. Here, Isaiah is describing what happens after death as a wedding banquet. In fact, we hear Jesus allude to this metaphor a couple of different times in the New Testament as he's talking about heaven. And in first century Judaism, wedding banquets were some of the happiest times of life. They lasted for days And they were complete with dancing and singing and wonderful food and fine wines. It's no wonder that they became a metaphor for what life would look like in God's eternal kingdom. I know some of the happiest moments in my life have been at my children's weddings and the receptions that have followed, complete with dancing and dinner and delicious food and wonderful wine and All of the people who were near and dear to our hearts were present. This is one of my favorite pictures from my son and daughter-in-law's wedding. I think it captures the joy and the laughter and the community and the happiness that we found in those events. This was the only wedding that my dad was alive and able to attend. And I just see this, his love and his joy on his face as he's dancing with his granddaughters and his new granddaughter-in-law. I think this is what heaven looks like, like a heavenly banquet. But now my dad has been reunited with those who have gone on before him, and there are no more tears, and death has been swallowed up in victory forever. You know, Jesus talks about heaven in the Gospels, not so much as a destination, a place to go, but the realm where God's will is always done. And so instead of talking about getting to heaven, Jesus talks about bringing heaven here on earth and that we should live like we are already in God's presence. So that's why he teaches us to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But he also points to this realm after life, after we have lived faithfully to God, caring for the hungry and the poor and the naked, the stranger among us, those who are imprisoned. As we stand before God on our final judgment day, we hope to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your eternal home. We see this clearly throughout the Gospel of John. You know, we see it in the story of Jesus and his friend Lazarus. And as Lazarus has died, Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, call for Jesus to come But Jesus arrives four days after Lazarus has been dead and buried. And these sisters are so disappointed that Jesus didn't come sooner, perhaps could have saved their brother from dying. To which Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, and those who believe in me will never die. And then he stands in front of Lazarus' tomb and he says, Lazarus, come out of there. I think people must have thought he had lost his mind until Lazarus came stumbling out of the tomb, once dead, now alive again. Jesus is showing that he has victory over death. 
And then again at the Last Supper in the Gospel of John, Jesus is gathered with his disciples and he's trying to make it clear to them that he's about to die. So he's offering these words of comfort and this promise. Here's what he says in John chapter 14. Sid read it for it just a minute ago. Don't be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My father's house has room to spare, and if that weren't the case, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And when I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and I will take you to be with me, so that where I am, you will be too. You know the way to the place I'm going. But Thomas asked, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? To which Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. See, Jesus and his disciples have been traveling together for three years, sometimes far from home. And unlike today, they couldn't just call ahead and make a hotel reservation or a restaurant for a meal. So the common practice was to send one or two people from your group ahead to find a campsite, to build a fire, to prepare a meal so that when the rest of the group arrived, they would be ready and waiting. And this is the same imagery that Jesus offers to us here. But instead of one of the disciples going forward to prepare a place, it is Jesus who is going forward to prepare a place for us in heaven. And then he makes this promise that he'll personally come back and take us to where he is. This is the hope that we have in Jesus And then we see that Jesus himself is tortured and crucified, died on the cross, and three days later, he too steps out of the tomb just as promised. This is God's response to our grief and our pain and our death. This is God's way of saying death will never have the final word. Christ is risen, and because he lives, you shall live also. Now, if you've been around here a while, you've probably heard this quote from Frederick Buechner before that says, Easter, or the resurrection of Jesus, means that the worst thing is never the last thing. I think for most of us, the most unimaginable thing in life is losing a loved one. And so Jesus' resurrection is saying that death will not have the final word. You know, that was hard to believe even when it happened. Do you remember the women were the first ones at the tomb and they met the risen Lord? And then they ran back to tell the disciples what they had seen and heard and the disciples didn't believe them until the risen Lord showed up in their midst and suddenly they believed. And then there's the Apostle Paul who spent the first part of his adult life persecuting Christians until he had a personal encounter with the risen Christ and his life was changed forever And so we hear these resurrection stories and we have to ask, do we believe this? I think sometimes we are like that father of the epileptic son, Pastor Bethany mentioned a couple weeks ago in her message. Sometimes we just have to say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. You know, faith is always about taking a leap, making a choice of what you choose to believe. You look at the evidence, You listen to the stories, and then you make a choice to believe or not. Now, atheists choose to believe that God does not exist. That's a faith decision. But when I hear the stories of Jesus about his resurrection, I choose to believe. And sometimes people ask me, do you really believe that? And I say, I not only believe it, but I am counting on it. You see, I think life is different when we live believing there is something more than just this life, more than just the here and the now. I think it makes a difference in the way that we grieve. I think it makes a difference when we have to summon up courage to do a hard thing. I think it makes a difference when we believe that someday we'll be reunited with the ones that we love and the comfort we receive from that. I choose to believe that. I can't prove that there's a heaven to you. I can only say that I trust what I read about the resurrection of Jesus and my personal life-lived experiences with the risen Lord. (coughs) 
Dr. Sam Parnia is a PhD in cell biology. He's also an MD who focuses on cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And his he ser currently serves at New York University's Langone Medical Center. And his research has been focused on near-death experiences, focusing on what happens to you when you are clinically dead and how he can help pe bring people back to life after they've been dead, not just their bodies, but their brain, their consciousness as well, the whole self. And so he listens to these stories of near-death experiences about people who had coded, who had been clinically dead, who had had no oxygen to their brain for 20 seconds or more. That's when your brain begins to die. And what he's found from some of these people who have been dead and survived is that they can talk about what was happening to them in those moments. And so he circles back to the medical team or the folks that were with them when they were clinically dead, and he finds out that what they are saying is exactly what happened. Now these are patients who should not be able to hear or process thought because the brain had shut down. And so he's asking the question, is it possible that our human consciousness is something more than just our brain activity. The evidence seems to say that our consciousness continues for some period of time after the brain is dead. And so it begs the question, could our human consciousness be connected to something more than brain activity, like a soul, for example? I have a couple of stories about near-death experiences that I'd like to share with you. One is from our daughter, Emily. She was an ICU nurse for five years at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. She also served on a rapid response team that would respond to any emergency throughout the hospital when they were called. And one night when she was working, the team was called, and they went to a room where there was a gentleman sitting in his chair, completely dressed in his clothing, and he had suffered a cardiac arrest. Now, it was unusual for someone to be sitting in a chair when they suffered a cardiac arrest. There were usually signs leading up to the fact that this might happen, and so this was truly caught everyone off guard. So they rushed in the room, and someone said, get the scissors. They needed to cut his clothes off of him. Someone else said, call Michael. Michael was the attending on duty that night. And someone else said, we need to get him back in bed. Well, this team was able to save his life. And the next day, my daughter Emily was his nurse on the floor where he was the patient. And once he learned that she'd been part of the team that saved his life, he said, may I ask you some questions? Who's Michael? Why did you need scissors? And why wasn't I in my bed? And Emily said, you know, it's really odd that you remember that because by all accounts, you were dead when those things were happening must have been really scary for you to hear those conversations. And he said, you know what? It's quite the opposite. He said, I was calm. I had a sense of peace. There was no fear and no panic. And he attributed that to the presence of a higher power that was with him in that moment. So that's my first story. My second story is from Pete. He shared this with me. It was during a time when his mom was in hospice care, and they were waiting for her to pass at any moment, any moment, and so they were keeping vigil beside her bed. And as Pete sat with her one day, she came into consciousness and she said, I just had a conversation with your older sisters. And Pete thought this was rather odd because Pete only has two brothers. So later that day, he was sharing this conversation with one of his brothers and he was reminded that their mom had had two miscarriages, both girls, before Pete was born. And then the next day, as Pete sat with her and she came into consciousness, she said, everyone is here. I'm either going to wake up tomorrow and see you, or I'm going to wake up tomorrow and see your dad and Jesus. You see, Jesus' resurrection announces that this life is not the end. And when we put our hope in that, we live differently. It's not that we want to die, but we're not afraid to die. Because we know it's not the end, it's more like a see you later. Because we know that we will be reunited with our loved ones who have gone before us. Now there's another account of a personal near-death experience that can be found in the book Proof of Heaven, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Afterlife. It's written by Dr. Eben Alexander. And in this book, he describes his 2008 near-death experience 
In fact, Evie, I checked, we have a copy of it in our library. So if anybody would like to take it home with you today, you can. And what he concludes after his own experience is that science can and will determine that the brain does not create consciousness and that our consciousness survives our bodily, our earthly body. And here's what he wrote. My experience showed me that the death of the body and the brain are not the end of consciousness, that human experience continues beyond the grave. More important, it continues under the gaze of a God who loves and cares for each one of us. So how do we explain these experiences? We may, like some, attribute it to our brain's last gasp at life before it shuts down. But perhaps like Dr. Parnia and Dr. Alexander wonder, maybe it points to the possibility that our consciousness, or our souls, survive our death. So, again, I can't prove to you there's a heaven. I can only say that I believe in Jesus and I believe his promises, that he's gone to prepare a place and that he'll come back to take us there. I believe the disciples and their testimony about Jesus' death and resurrection. And the resurrection makes sense to me as God's way of saying that cruelty and evil and sin and hate and even death will never have the final word in God's kingdom. So faith is a choice. We look at the testimony, we consider the data, we think about the ramifications of the objects of our faith, and then we choose to believe or not to believe. I choose to believe. I choose to put my trust in the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life, and whoever believes in me shall never die. And I'm inviting you to do the same. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for everything, for your love, for your mercy, for your grace, for the blessings of this life. Thank you for being as near to us as the air that we breathe. Thank you for sending Jesus to show us the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus, I choose to put my trust in you. I believe but help me in my moments of unbelief. And help me to live my life in the here and the now so that I can spend eternity with you. It's in your holy name that we pray. Amen.